gospel lesson there, if we could understand the power of that song there, um, praising God, usually is not our go-to action when things go wrong. But praising God, it, the Bible says that God inhabits praise. So there is a place where everything goes away, all the sorrows, everything goes away. It's right, it's caught right in the middle of praising God. And if God's people could actually praise him when things go wrong, rather than get discouraged because things go wrong, we would be a stronger people for it. Uh, Kim, thank you so much for that song. It was, you did a beautiful job writing and singing that song. Uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, if you'll turn to Judges chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16. Uh, we're just going to run right through all of it this morning. Um, I do love the book of Judges, but it seems that every time we visit it, the story starts out the same way. Um, let's I'm gonna look at the very first verse of Judges chapter 13. Let's, let's just look at the verse 1, and you'll see the story starts out in the same way. Uh, Judges 13.1, it says, Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. So, here, here goes that back and forth story again. Back and forth, constantly. God, God opens it up so that the children of Israel are free. And then the children of Israel go back into captivity because they turn away from God over and over and over again. So God sends in a judge to deliver them when they get, get their mind focused on God again. God sends in a judge and delivers them and then they're delivered for so many years and then it goes right back into it where they need a judge. That's why we have the book of Judges. The Israelites do well for a while and then they turn from God, go back into captivity and then there's another judge. But this story, this time, in Judges chapter 13, God does things a little bit different. This time he creates a judge from scratch. Every other time that you look at the book of Judges, God, God looks at a man and sends that man in as a judge to deliver Israel from their captivity. But this time it's different. This time God doesn't just pick a guy to be a judge. He creates a judge. He starts from the beginning. He starts from scratch. Judges 13 and verse 2 says, Now there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. Are there no verses on there? Okay, we just have a title screen today? Okay, something, something went wrong, so the verses aren't going to pop up on the screen. Unless you look at a website later, um, we might be able to get them on there, but they're not going to be on the screen. So don't take my word for it. Open your Bible. <laughs> so it says that I'm going to read that verse again Judges 13 verse 2 says now there was a certain man from Zorah and the family of the, Dan, of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah and his wife was barren and had no children this time God's going to raise up a judge from a picture of barrenness this is a unique story in scripture he's going to create this picture but he's going to take it from complete barrenness an angel comes up to Manoah's wife and tells her that her life is about to make, uh, take an extremely huge change. But there's some unique details that come along with the news. In verse 3, it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed now, you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now therefore... Please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Now this is like the strangest doctor's visit of all time. An angel comes up to Manoah's wife and says, congratulations, you're pregnant. And then what great news. This is a lady who cannot have children. Congratulations, you're pregnant. Now here's some instructions. Stay away from alcohol, which by the way is typical advice. Stay away from alcohol, you're pregnant. Stay away from alcohol, but also stay away from unclean meat. Don't eat anything that's unclean. And by the way, that goes along with Jewish uh, dietary customs. Don't, don't eat anything unclean. So stay away from alcohol. Don't eat anything that's unclean. 
And last but not least, never give your son a haircut. Have a great day. And then the angel disappears. The, those are the instructions that are given to Manoah's wife. You're going to have a baby. Now stay away from alcohol. Got it. Don't eat anything unclean. That's I already know. And never give your kid a haircut. Goodbye. That's the instructions. And as strange as those instructions are to us, they make perfect sense to Manoah and his wife. They are, they are clear instructions. Their son was supposed to be a Nazarite. The word Nazarite actually means to be separate or set apart. That is what the word means. God's bringing Israel hope from a barren situation, and he's asking that this new life that he is going to bring into the picture be set apart for him. I want this thing set apart. Verse 24, it says, So the woman bore a son and called his name Samson, and the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. Here we have the story of Samson, the man with the coolest hairstyle in all of history. Samson's got, I mean, if you could have that hairstyle, you would want that hairstyle. Not necessarily the style, but what came with the hair. Um, you would want this. God has brought life into a barren existence. And he wants to do amazing things through that life. It says the Lord blessed him. And boy, was that ever true. God truly blessed Samson. According to the vow of the Nazarite, they were not to drink of the fruit of the grapevine. Stay away from that. You're not supposed to touch anything that's dead. And they were never to cut their hair for the entire time of their vow. Now, Samson's entire life was dedicated to this vow. Never cut, never cut his hair. But Samson was a very immature and entitled type personality. If you read the story of Samson, you'll see that this guy, he's young, he's a little arrogant, and he's got that entitled personality. He wants what he wants. Samson was more focused on the things that brought pleasure to himself than he was on the fact that his life was supposed to be set apart for God. That from his birth set him apart for God. But he got so focused on what he wanted. And we see his personality coming to light in the very first, his very first recorded act. Judges chapter 14 in verse 1 says, Now Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. So he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughter of the Philistines. Now therefore, get her for me as a wife. Then his father and mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that you, you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. Samson sees a Philistine girl and he's got his eyes locked on her. I want that girl. I want her to be my wife. Couldn't you pick somebody from Israel? Couldn't you pick somebody that is of the people of God? Can we just choose from somebody here? I want her. Go get her to be my wife. Now let's not forget that the Philistines are the people who the Israelites are, are being held captive by. These are, the, these are the people that are oppressing the Israelites. Now Samson wants to join hands with the nation that's holding his people captive. It's not a smart move, but Samson's not really a smart guy. So we're not, we're not going to give him credit in this area. His parents try to talk him out of it. But Samson wants what Samson wants. So they all make a trip down to Timnah to get this girl. The parents try to talk him out of it, but Samson wants what Samson wants. Verse 5, chapter 14. So Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah, now to, this, now to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he tore the lion apart as one would have torn apart a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. But he did not tell his father and mother what he had done. Then he went down and, and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. This is where we find out about how God blessed Samson. <clears throat> God had given him an incredible amount of strength. Samson is a really strong guy. He just tore a lion apart as if it were a baby goat. And it says he didn't have anything in his hands to do it. He just ripped a lion apart. 
Now that's something cool to find out about yourself. I'm really, really strong. A lion comes, that is something that you, you would normally fear. But this lion comes and he just tears this lion apart. Samson is a very, very strong man. <clears throat> God has blessed him with enough strength to take down any enemy that comes his way. You, are, you have an incredible amount of strength. His strength is an amazing attribute, but his faithfulness is not. Samson's got a lot of strength, but his faithfulness, uh, he's lacking in a huge way when it comes to faithfulness. Look at what he does when he turn, returns to Timnah to actually get his bride. In verse 8 of chapter 14, After some time, when he returned to get her, he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the carcass of the lion. He took some of it in his hands and went along eating. When he came to his father and mother, he gave some to them, and they also ate. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. One of the things that pertained to the Nazarite vow, if you remember, was to stay away from anything that was dead. They're not supposed to touch a dead body. Stay away from that. Now he's not only eating honey from the carcass of a lion, he's sharing his newfound treasure with his family. And they're eating the honey too. But he did not tell them where he got the honey because he knows he wasn't supposed to get the honey from that lion. He's supposed to stay away from this stuff. Samson has totally disregarded the fact that he was supposed to be set apart for God. That was the purpose of his life. I'm going to create a new life in Israel. And in that new life, I'm asking one thing, set him apart for me. I want him to be a Nazarite so I can use him for my glory. I want you to set Samson apart for me. But Samson's going to do what Samson's going to do. He's just, he does not, he's not focused on the fact that he has a purpose in life. He focused on the fact that there was honey in a lion and he doesn't care about the fact that he's supposed to stay away from that. Samson wants what Samson wants. So he, he goes forward and he does it. They finally reach Timnah and Samson marries this young Philistine girl. And then he throws a seven day party, which was the custom. Throws a seven day party. And during this party, Samson finds the opportunity to get some free party gifts. What he does is he tells the Philistines a riddle. I'm going to give you guys a riddle. And in that, I expect to get party gifts from that. Let's look at verse 12 of chapter 14. Then Samson said to them, <clears throat> let me pose a riddle to you. If you can correctly solve and explain it to me within the seven days of the feast, then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothing. But if you cannot explain it to me, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothing. And they said to him, pose your riddle that we may hear it. So he said to them, out of the eater came something to eat. And out of the strong came something sweet. Now for three days they could not explain the riddle. Samson's playing with fire here. He tells them the riddle about the lion. He's referred this riddle's about the lion that he got the honey from. Now nobody knows about that lion except for Samson, so it's a pretty decent riddle. He says the riddle is out of the eater came something sweet and out of the strong, or out of the eater came something to eat and out of the strong came something sweet. How could anybody know the answer to this riddle except for Samson? But after three days, the Philistines start worrying about the chance that they might lose this arrangement. They might lose the bet here. Like, we don't know the answer. So they go to Samson's wife. They threaten to kill her if she doesn't get the answer for them. It's a beautiful story. You see the, the, the riddles and the violence, and it's, it's a beautiful thing. So she goes to Samson for the answer, but he doesn't want to tell Sam Samson doesn't want to tell her the answer. This is his riddle. He's the only one with the answer. It's a sure win. But then things change. Verse 17 says, Now she had wept on him the seven days while the feast lasted. And it happened on the seventh day that he told her because she pressed him so much. Then she explained the riddle to the sons of her people. Samson's wife says, You've got to tell me the riddle. And he says, No. And then she nags and nags and nags and nags, and he finally says, fine. 
Here's the answer to the riddle. And then she goes and she explains it to the Philistines. Samson's wife just pestered him to the point of giving in. None of us have ever experienced anything like this. Now there's smiles, no laughter. You're smart people. Not, they, you've been pestered by people. Sometimes it's a little kid. A lot of times it's a little kid. When are we leaving? When are we leaving? When are we leaving? What time's dinner? What time's dinner? What time's dinner? What's for dinner? What's, there you go. Now, now I'm seeing people relate. We've all been pestered to the point where we just like, okay, here, go away now. This is where Samson, this is where Samson's at. Okay, stop pestering me. Here's the answer. Now go away. She leaves and gives the Philistines the answer to the riddle. And this answer lights a fuse, creating an explosive relationship between the Philistines and Samson. Let's look at a couple of the things that Samson does after this. <clears throat> Samson ends up leaving. When he finds out that they know the answer to the riddle, he gets mad. He ends up leaving without his wife. And his father-in-law ends up giving his wife to the person that was Samson's best man. Now she's, she's married, but now to Samson's best man. This upsets Samson. So then Samson makes the next move. In chapter 15 and verse 4, this is what he does. Then Samson went and caught 300 foxes, and he took torches, turned the foxes tail to tail, and put a torch between each pair of tails. When he had set the torches on fire, he let the foxes go into the standing grains of the Philistines and burned up both the shocks and the standing grain, as well as the vineyards and the olive groves. 300 foxes just got caught in the middle of a family feud. If anybody's having a bad day, it's the foxes. He catches these poor little creatures, ties them tail to tail, sets a torch on fire between them and sends them off running and burns up the crops of the Philistines. Surprisingly enough, the Philistines don't like that. They're not happy about what he just did. So they take his ex-wife and his father-in-law and they burn them alive. This is the, you know, it's the natural progression of things, right? Now Samson gets upset again. So he takes matters into his own hands. In verse 15 of chapter 15, it says he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, reached out his hand and took it and killed a thousand men with it. You see things building in the story. Samson's been blessed with all the strength he could possibly need to take down every enemy that ever threatens him. He is a strong man. You don't kill a thousand people with an old jawbone. You don't catch 300 foxes. If I catch a fox, it was an accident. I didn't mean to do it, and somehow I got it trapped. That's the only way I'll ever catch a fox. He catches 300 of them, sets torches on fire, and sends them to destroy the Philistines' property. This is a strong man. Samson's been blessed. He, he's got great abilities. Samson's story is only four chapters long, and I encourage you to go home and read chapter 13 through 16 of the book of Judges because there's a lot of amazing details in it. But I want to kind of fast forward to the end to see his demise, what actually takes Samson down. In chapter 16, in verse 4, we have a very popular story unfold here. It says, Afterward, it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the Lord of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him and find out where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Here's the famous story of Samson and Delilah. He finds this girl in Sorek falls in love with Delilah. Now Samson falls in love with Delilah, but Delilah is not in love with Samson. She's in love with what she can get out of the relationship for herself. Samson just ran into the female version of himself. Not exactly who he wants to run into, but this is who he runs into. She, it's, she's an entitled personality also. They're both people who want what they want in spite of what they know is right. They know it's right to do, but they also know what they want, and they get what they want. 
Delilah's been sent in to find out the secret of Samson's strength. Where, where does he find the kind of strength that he has? Where, how does he become so strong? And by the way, if Samson, this is just my opinion, which means absolutely nothing. But if Samson looked like he had muscles in places we don't even have places, chances are you wouldn't question where he gets his strength. He would look huge. But for some reason, they want to know why he's so strong. But so there is a chance Samson might not have even looked that strong. Why would you question where he gets his strength if he looked like the biggest person the planet's ever produced? They want to know where this guy's getting his strength. So they send Delilah in and say, okay, I want to know. Where, where does he get his strength? Judges 16 and verse 6. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your strength lies and with what you may be bound to afflict you. And Samson said to her, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, then I shall become weak and be like other men. So the Lord of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, and she bound him with them. Now men were lying in wait, staying with her in the room. And she said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he broke the bowstrings as a strand of yarn breaks when it touches fire. So the secret of his strength was not known. Delilah asked Samson, what could we bind you with that we could capture and afflict you? Okay, right there. I don't know about you, but I'm thinking that might be a red flag. How can we, how, what can we use to bind you so we can afflict you? So we can torture you? If you're ever in a conversation with somebody and they want to know a secret, if they want to know what's going on, they say, can, what, what can we do to bind you? so we can torture you. You have not found a friend. That is, that is not a friend. How can we capture you and torture you, Samson? And he, then he gives her the answer. Well, he lies to her. How can we torture you, Samson? So Samson makes up this story about seven fresh bowstrings. And then she ties him up with them while he's sleeping and he breaks free from them. So not only did Delilah say, what can we do to capture you, to bind you, so you, you're trapped and we can afflict you, Samson? What can we do? Uh, you seven fresh bowstrings that have never been dried, and that I, I wouldn't be able to break out of that. And then she goes the, that night and ties him up with those. In the morning says, hey, the Philistines are here to capture you, and he snaps them. It doesn't take a lot to figure out that this girl's no good. Right then, if you didn't figure it out by your first question, you should figure it out by the fact that she just tied you up and tried to capture you that way. But Samson ignores the facts, completely ignores it. Now Delilah is mad because Samson lies to her, so he makes up another story about new ropes. Well, if they, if they tie me with new ropes that have never been used before, I will become weak like any other man, and you, then you can afflict me. So what does she do? That night, she ties him up with new ropes. In the morning, she says, hey, Philistines are here. He gets up and he snaps them like a thread. Red flag number two. But what does Samson do? Nothing. He just completely ignores it. So she ties him up with the bowstrings, ties him up with the ropes. And then he tells her another version. She comes up and says, oh, I'm upset because you lied to me, Samson. Okay, all right, make it better. If you braid my hair, I will become weak. So she does it, and it doesn't work. Now she's really frustrated. So look at what she does in verse 15. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death. That's really dramatic. That he told her all his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak 
and be like any other man. Samson ends up falling to sleep, and I know it shocked me too, but Delilah has his head shaved. She does it again. Verse 20, And she said, The Philistines are on, upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Then the Philistines took him, <clears throat> put out his eyes, and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters, and he became a grinder in the prison. Here's one of the saddest statements recorded in Scripture. He did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Samson's story is a really unique story in the Bible. Now, to end the story, Samson is put into prison. They celebrate by putting, making a show out of him, making a spectacle out of Samson place in between the two pillars of the temple. <clears throat> and they have so many Philistines in there mocking him. And he does pray that God will give him his strength. He knocks down the pillars of the building. And the Bible says he killed more people, including himself, in his death than he did in his life. So Samson was used to do something great for God. <clears throat> but his story is a tragic story. But his story is so unique. Look at all the other judges. There was this man, and God used him as a judge. This is this man, and God used him as a judge. But Samson's story, his mother was barren, and God brought in a new life for his glory. I'm going to create a judge from scratch. He's blessed with everything he needs to face his enemies. So much strength. But at the end of his life, he learned a valuable lesson. You will never be stronger than the weakest part of your life. And that applies to us also. You will never be stronger than the weakest part of your life. With everything God gave him, he never fulfilled everything God had for him. God gave him so much. And his life ended tragically. He never accomplished everything God had for him. He did kill a lot of Philistines, but the Philistines were still around, eventually taken out by David. He learned that he would never be stronger. He, you, none of us will ever be stronger than the weakest part of our lives. <clears throat> Samson listened to his feelings over what he knew was, knew was right. Now this is where everything gets personal. <clears throat> I like reading the stories in the Bible, but then it always applies to me personally. And if God, uh, God does something to me throughout the week that I don't like, I come here and I share what he did to me so I can share it with you so you don't have to like it either. You know, I, that's, that's, I share that with you. If God places something on my heart, I'm going to share it with you because that's the message that he's given. And I want you to hear that message. <clears throat> when pastors preach a sermon on Samson, they usually s preach a sermon against Samson. Because that's pretty much the only way to preach a sermon on Samson, is to preach against him. He was foolish and self-absorbed. He did what he wanted in spite of what he knew what God wanted. That was the life of Samson. I'm going to do what I want. What about what God wants? I want what I want. And I'm going to do what I want. Samson is someone I used to look down on until I realized how much potential we have to be just like Samson. It's amazing when it's you, you don't look down on yourself as much as you look down on somebody else. Like when I read the story of Samson, I'm like, what a shame. And then when I see those tendencies pop up in my own life, I'm like, I can see it. I, I, can see, I can see what he did there. It doesn't make it right, but I can see it. <clears throat> when we got saved, God created a new life out of a barren situation. When you got saved, a new life was there. Not the old life that didn't work. God created a new life out of a barren situation when you got saved. We were lost without hope and God gave us new life. He gave us his life. But he also gave us a responsibility. Samson was to be a Nazarite, which means to be set apart for God. But look at our story. 
In John 17, 17, Jesus is praying for all those that will be saved. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. The word sanctify means to be set apart. There's a new life in this situation when you got saved. You got saved, and then God sanctified you. Same, same meaning as the word Nazarite, to be set apart. That new life was given to you, and then you have been set apart. God created a new life, and then he set you apart for his glory. That's what God did. This is your story, not Samson's story. Not only that, but he gave you everything you would ever need to stand against your enemies. He gave you that too. Look at 1 John 4, 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Do you have Jesus Christ when you, when you get saved? Yes. Is he enough to take care of every enemy that you'll ever face? Yes. Yes. Strong enough to take on Satan did and won. He created a new life when you got saved. He sanctified you and set you apart for his glory. And then he gave you all the strength you need to stand against every snare that Satan will ever lay out for you. That's your story, not, Sa not Samson's story. So we can really take this personally. We are a new life brought out of a barren situation. We've been set apart for God and we have everything we need to stand against our enemies. But we often get so caught up in our weakness that we don't recognize when God can't bless us. Sometimes God can't bless you. Sometimes God can't bless me. Because we've gotten into a habit or into a lifestyle that God cannot condone. You are doing things that I can't bless. I, I cannot condone that. I cannot bless that lifestyle you've chosen. We begin to start trusting in our own feelings. And we start pouring our lives into things that catch our attention, even when we know they're wrong. Church becomes second priority. Giving to, the, to support God's ministry turns into an afterthought. Love and forgiveness get pushed to the side, and it's all because we want what we want. I don't like it when these stories apply to me. <laughs> and, and I'm sure you don't like it when the stories in the Bible apply to you, unless they're the good stories, and then we like that. We do what pleases us, and we fail to remember that our life, uh, God created a new life in us set apart for his glory. That's your story, not Samson's story. God created a new life and gave it to you. All things became new. He sanctified you or set you apart for his glory, and he's given you all the strength you need to stand against the wiles of the devil. He's given you all the strength you need to, to you are an overcomer. All that's yours. All that's mine. But sometimes we end up in a situation where God has to say, I'm stepping back. He's never going to leave you nor forsake you. You're still, you're, you're still saved. But the blessings that he wants to pour on your life, the things he wants to bless you with and, and use you for, he's got to step back. I, can't, I cannot do this. You're going in a way that I can't, I can't be there. I can't support that. I can't condone your lifestyle. Before long, God can't continue to bless the lifestyle we've chosen. <clears throat> Samson didn't discern that God was missing because God wasn't what Samson desired the most. He had his eyes on other things. And when we start trusting in our feelings more than God, we end up destroying ourselves. Our story, not Samson's. And God even warns us about it. Proverbs 3, 5, 6, and 7. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. 
fear the Lord and depart from evil. Samson got so caught up in feelings that he was living in idolatry. Now I want to introduce you to one of the biggest idols of all time. And it's not an idol that we normally think of as an idol. <clears throat> but we might be guilty of having that idol in our life. Now you might be sitting there thinking, <clears throat> I don't have any idols. I'm faithful. I read my Bible. I go to church. I pray. I'm there for other people. I give. I support God's ministry. <clears throat> I don't have any idols. Which is a, a good place to, it's a good feeling when you say I don't have any idols. But I want to introduce you to one of the biggest idols of all. Idolatry is when we, when we have something other than God that's got a hold of our hearts. That's, that's what idolatry is. Where something's got a hold of our hearts and we see that we invest more into that than we do in God. And more times than not, it's our feelings. We don't often think of our feelings as an idol. But a lot of times our feelings become an idol. If the way we feel towards someone is a way that's contrary to what God wants and we refuse to change, we've created an idol out of our own desires. It's just that simple. If we find ourselves pouring our lives into various things and give very little thought to the fact that we have been set apart for God himself, we're making the same mistake that Samson made. Satan doesn't want you to know this, but you're very important people. You are so important. God created a new life. And he has set you apart for his glory. And he has given you everything you need to make it through this life with every attack that Satan could possibly bring against you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You have so much strength. You are very important people. You have been given an incredible gift. God has chosen you. He set you apart. And he's given you victory over your enemies. And all Satan can do is send temptation your way, hoping that you're going to take the bait. Do we realize that's the only power Satan has over us? I can tempt them. I'll throw temptation their way, but it's their choice whether to take the temptation. It's, it's your choice. Being tempted is not a sin. Yielding to temptation is the sin. You don't have to yield. But we will be tempted. And Satan will send temptation your way. But you don't have to give in to that temptation. He's just hoping you're going to take the bait. But here's, the, here's what's annoying about the whole picture. The desires of the flesh are going to pester you until you give in. Just like Samson's wife and Delilah did to him. Are you going to give me what I want? Are you going to give me what I want? Are you going to give me what I want? Are you going to give me what I want? I could do that for another five minutes, but it would get annoying. But this is what the flesh does to us also. You know you want that. You know it's not pleasing to God, but you know you want that. You know the way you feel about that person is not pleasing to God, but it does, make, it does give some satisfaction to feel that way about that person. So go ahead and feel that way about that person. You know God wants you to do this or go to this place or talk to that person, but what about, ple what, about what pleases you? And your flesh will pester you and pester you and pester you to give in to the things that the flesh wants just so that you don't do what you know you've been set apart to do. If we choose to ignore the trap, we'll end up in a place where God cannot bless us because of our decisions. Don't ignore the trap. Don't ignore it because Satan's going to set it. You don't have to take it. You don't have to take the bait. But Satan does set up the trap constantly for us. And if Satan can convince us that we are not placing anything before God when we actually are placing something before God, we've fallen right into the trap that he set for us. Now, I don't know where, you're, where you stand right now 
I can only look into my own life and see where I stand. But you might stop and consider it just for a few minutes. God set you apart for his glory. You've been sanctified. You've been set apart for him. Now, is every aspect of your life, are you living in a way that's pleasing to him? Or is there any area of your life that you're saying, I know I shouldn't be, but I am. The flesh has pestered me and I have given into it. And you say, now this is the time right now that I need to go to God and say, all right, God, would you please renew my strength? Give me, give me what I need. I need to lay those things aside. I need to forgive this person. I need to start being faithful in this area. I need to stop doing this. Whatever the scenario is, Satan has laid a trap out for you. Don't ignore that trap. We're not talking about Samson's story this morning. We're talking about our story. And I don't know where you stand. I don't know what God's doing with this message in your life. I know what he's doing with mine, and you know what he's doing with yours. But don't ignore what he's doing. If God has spoken to you in some way, in just a few minutes we're going to have an invitation, and I beg you to respond to God. Respond. If he's calling you for something, answer that and respond to him. You are very important people. You have been, you are a new life brought out of a barren situation. You have been set apart for God's glory. And you've got everything you need to stand against Satan. Don't ignore the traps. Don't ignore the traps. Stand with me this morning.